Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, Join the Conversation, and I'd like to welcome you from wherever you may be watching. Transforming the way that the festival is delivered, from live appearances to an online version, and offering an even stronger, more diverse and plentiful series of events is a reflection of our belief that literature and the arts provide a catalyst for dialogue, creativity, empathy, laughter and tears, binding communities together. We're enormously grateful to all our speakers who've dedicated their time and talents to the festival. Please buy their books as a way of enhancing the festival experience. It's my pleasure to invite you, on behalf of my colleagues and board, as well as myself, to join the conversation. We hope that you'll do so in person next November, if at all possible. Charleston in South Carolina is a beautiful, historic and hospitable town, and the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival will definitely be going from strength to strength. I'm Suzanne Pollack, Director of Development for the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. This year, more than ever, we are so grateful to our generous donors, returning and new, who've made it possible to offer free sessions to everyone everywhere, building a truly international audience. There's still time for you to become a donor. We're taking donations throughout the month of November. So if you would like to become a sponsor, and we urge you to do so, please contact me using my email on the website. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bill Kennard. I'm here because I'm a devoted fan of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. And I have the honor today of being able to introduce our next event. Kim Derrick served as Britain's ambassador to the United States from January 2016 until December 2019 a very turbulent time in American politics and the subject of his book Collateral Damage. Kim is a member of the House of Lords. He is one of Britain's most distinguished diplomats. And he will be interviewed today by Paul Adamson. Paul Adamson is a leading commentator on foreign affairs in Europe. He is the publisher of Encompass, which is an influential online magazine. And both of these gentlemen are very good friends of mine. I had the privilege of serving as the United States Ambassador to the European Union at the same time that Kim Derrick served as Britain's Ambassador to the EU. And Paul Adamson, who is also Brussels-based, was there as well. And, and Paul and Kim were really instrumental in helping me, my embassy, and hence the United States government understand the intricacies of EU policy. So I'm very, very grateful to both of them. And here are a couple of fun facts about these guys. So both Kim and Paul love Charleston. And when, when Kim is here, he and his wife Vanessa love to stroll through the beautiful gardens of Charleston. And Kim actually studied biology and zoology before becoming a diplomat. And he and his wife, can literally rattle off the names of various plant species in Latin. So Paul and his wife Denise also love Charleston. Their favorite activity here is to go to the farmer's market at Marion Square on Saturdays and buy fresh fruit and vegetables and then stroll through the shopping district of King Street. I'm so happy that they have taken the time to participate in the festival I'm grateful to them, and of course, I'm grateful to all of you for joining us. Welcome. Good afternoon, or even good morning, or good evening, depending on which time zone you're watching this from. Um, thanks to Bill Canard for that very kind introduction. I say very kind. Kim and I have not been able to, to see and watch the introduction, so we can only assume it was very generous and flattering as obviously Kim and I deserve. Um, we are here as part of the Charleston to Charleston um, uh, Literary Festival uh, coming out of South Carolina, uh, an annual event now, which is very well regarded by everybody. And we are told that this event uh, with Kim Derrick has a, a very large number of registrations into the 
many, many hundreds. So no pressure on Kim and I to actually make sure we entertain you for the next hour or so. Um, there will be also a, a chat function. Uh, and if you want to ask questions of Kim as well, I will not try and monopolize him for the entire hour we have in front of us. But if you'd rather sit back and drink a coffee or have a glass of wine or champagne or a beer and just listen to us talking for the next hour, that's fine. I have plenty of questions for Kim. Um, Kim, as you know, has been introduced by Bill, so I will not repeat what Bill said. Uh, but Kim, of course, is the author of his new book, Collateral Damage. You can see behind him, uh, strategically placed on his bookshelf, but very far away, uh, his book. So if you have very poor eyesight like I have, let me do this, which is nearer. Uh, so the book has been out for about six weeks, and it is a very, very good read. Uh, we're going to talk about also the momentous uh, developments in the United States in the past few days. Obviously, we can't avoid that, um, uh, but we are here to talk about Kim's book as well. So let me start, Kim, by asking you quite an obvious introductory question. Why, why did you write the book? Obviously, the book covers your, your entire career as, a, as ambassador in Washington in three and a half years or so, but you do start the book by recounting the famous leak and your last days as, as ambassador. Was it a question of you wanting to get out your side of the story? First of all, Paul, um, uh, let me just say how great it is to be doing this with you. You and I have known each other, what, 30 years? So yeah. this, is, this yeah. is very nice. And second, how much it means to me to be doing this Charleston to Charleston festival, because um, we have a cottage down in Cornwall, very close to Charleston down there, and Charleston in the US, Vanessa and I visited while we were posted in Washington, stayed with, with Bill and Deborah Kennard, and it is, I think, the most beautiful place I've been to in America. So I just wish we could be there, because that would have been such fun. Um, on the book, um, people tend to assume that I wrote it because of the leak and the aftermath to leak of my resignation. And the truth is that I had signed up with my agent and undertaken to, um, to write a book uh, some six months before any of that happened, just because I felt I had lived through uh, the most extraordinary period in history with uh, both Brexit and the election of Donald Trump, that I had something to say about it. I've always had kind of ambitions to, to write when I uh, retire. I thought this was the uh, this was the perfect story to start with because it is it was and is so uh, extraordinary, um, and what the leak did was kind of increase the salience of the story and get a few more publishers interested in it, and I thought I would still in the end the bulk of the book should be the story of of that period and some conclusions attempted conclusions about what was going on with this political earthquake in the UK with Brexit and the political earthquake in the US with the election of Donald Trump. But then bookend it with the story of the leak. So in the end, that was the structure that suggested itself to me and that, that's what I wrote. But I was always going to write about my time in Washington. Okay, but for the benefit of those watching us who are maybe not familiar with all the details, um, could you remind us of the, the main events leading up to your your last days and before you resigned? Early, Jan early July 2019, uh, Friday morning, uh, I am um, sitting in the office and my chief of staff comes to the door and says, there's been a leak. And I promise your initial thought was another burst water pipe in the residence because <laughs> people are always getting flooding in the residence. And then I see behind her, the press uh, spokesman for the embassy and uh, and her, her colleagues, and I think a different kind of leak. And they come in and they say that one of our Sunday newspapers, the British newspapers, has some 20 pages of reporting from the Washington embassy, and they're going to publish it on Sunday. Uh, and then we managed to get via uh, the special advisors in the foreign secretary's office, um, tantalizingly, one page from each document that the, uh, that the newspaper had, and we checked back through our files and realized that most of the documents they have are cables from the previous three or four weeks, one about President Trump's state visit to the UK, one about uh, 
the first campaign rally of the 2020 Trump campaign, one about uh, the administration's policy on Iran, but then the dynamite was a letter I had written to a very small circulation of people, highly classified letter about the first six months of the, um, of the Trump presidency. It was intended for a National Security Council meeting in the UK. So it was a handful of senior ministers and people like the chief of defense staff, uh, heads of the agencies. Um, and uh, uh, I was encouraged to provide a free and frank um, uh, no holds barred assessment of how the Trump administration had done over its first six months. And that's what I did. And that was where all the material was that so enraged the president once he once it leaked and once the US media picked it up. And after I mean, it was all in the British papers on the Sunday, uh, the um, US press picked it up for, for the Monday. Uh, the president commented on it and said uh, by tweet, um, some fairly critical stuff about me personally, and then say we won't deal with this man anymore. And I resigned overnight on Wednesday. So it was announced in the UK, early hours in the US, but um, uh, in the UK at 11 o'clock um, on Wednesday morning. And within those three days, were you hoping, expecting to, to stay on? Were you encouraged by your colleagues back in London to kind of, you know, sit back and let it just take its natural flow and not have yeah. to resign? What made I mean, you into the idea of resigning? Yeah, I mean, Paul, there were people in the embassy um, and friends, uh, back in the Foreign Office, who were saying, um, you can ride this out. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I started thinking about resignation by Monday morning. Uh, and my wife, Vanessa, predicted quite early that I would, I would need to resign. And there were three or four things that triggered my resignation. Uh, one of which was uh, the president's comment, we won't deal with you anymore, followed up by, by being disinvited to a couple of things in the White House. Um, and then uh, uh, the thought that I just wouldn't be able to do the job I was sent to do if I couldn't talk to the most senior le uh, level of contacts in the US administration. And then, as I've said a lot of times since my resignation, a factor, though not the lead factor, was back in London in the political world, there was a debate between the last two candidates to replace Theresa May as Prime Minister, Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson. And Jeremy Hunt said that if he won, uh, he would insist um, that uh, I stayed on. Uh, and Boris Johnson asked the same question, sort of ducked and weaved and basically talked about something else. Now, I think Boris was just basically trying to keep his options open. I don't think he definitively decided to fire me or pull me out or whatever. But uh, as I've said, as I say several times since, um, it was a factor. Uh, with hindsight, I probably might have concluded in any case, even if Boris hadn't said that, that I should resign just because the job would be impossible to do. You could cling on, but you couldn't do the job. Um, if people in the administration, senior people in the administration, weren't prepared to deal with you. And it would have been highly embarrassing and, frankly, a bit humiliating. So once I'd taken the decision to go overnight on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, that was kind of cathartic. And I was really glad I'd taken that decision. And to this day, I think it was the right decision. If anything, I think I should have decided maybe 12 hours earlier than I did. But, um, but you know, people always ask me, did you resign because of Boris failing to back you? Yeah. And I always say it was a factor, but not the lead factor. Okay. And as time goes by, and it's almost well, more than 15 months since you did, did resign, do you have a clear idea, not necessarily who actually was responsible for the leak, but what were their, what were their motivations? What were they trying to achieve, do you think? Um, I don't know on the second, and I am fascinated to know, and we may find out, because on the first point, who did it? No name has been released but the police have been doing a year long, 15 month long investigation. And they arrested someone uh, a few weeks ago, um, name not released, that wherever it is, is back out on bail, wasn't a foreign office official. Um, and, you know, we will know more in due course, Paul. Assuming, assuming, which is not a given, that charges are laid, they may not. Right. 
the, the title is very arresting, Collateral Damage, and you and I had more than one conversation about the need for a, a snappy title while you're writing the book. Um, uh, did you see yourself, though, as, as collateral damage yourself, or was it more a reflection of how others maybe thought of you, saw you at the time, collateral damage? Um, I confess it was it was Vanessa's idea, the title, and... Um, Vanessa being Kim's better half, by far better half. Yes, and um, we put some options through to the publisher. Initially, the, the editor, my editor, uh, Arabella Pike, didn't like collateral damage, but everyone else liked it so much they persuaded her. And it was essentially, I mean, it should almost be a question mark at the end of it. Well, that would be too, too inward. But one of the possibilities on, on why my cables, why my reporting was leaked, Paul, was not about me, but about who succeeded me. And the British press had been speculating, because I was due to finish in six months anyway, I'd been speculating about who might succeed me. And there were a number of names out there, all of them, all of them civil servants, diplomats. Um, and, you know, there is a theory that, uh, that um, some people in the Conservative Party and maybe elsewhere in British politics thought that to understand Donald Trump, you needed a fellow politician in Washington. As you know, there have been politicians as ambassador in Washington, not a mere diplomat thinking <laughs> inside that diplomatic box. So one of the questions in my mind, which we, uh, you know, we may find out um, uh, if, uh, if charges are laid and there, and there is a court case, uh, is whether or not the individual who did it had motives like that for doing it, or whether it was simply a junior, poorly paid civil servant who, for example, did it for money. You write in the book in, a, in a almost quite a matter of fact way about what happened. And you, and you, you don't seem particularly angry or, or bitter about what happened. Is that because you're basically keeping your own counsel? It's nobody else's business to know how you felt? Or is it because you're acknowledging that there's no point in wasting time mulling over this and it's just best to have closure and move on? Um, it's more the second, uh, and the only thing, I mean, in the end, I don't really, I mean, you know, it was a pretty appalling period of four days or so, and you know, I could have done without it, but, but we've moved on, and uh, I'm enjoying doing other things now, and <laughs> actually, I thought I would miss the Foreign Office hugely after 42 years in it. I'm amazed at how little I miss it and how much I enjoy what I do now and the much you know, gentler pace of life and all the, the variety of things when you do, when you're not, you know, as I say nine to five, it was more like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, in the office and, you know, the huge sort of burden of being out every night and that kind of thing. So, so I'm happy around. My main interest in what happens on, on the arrest and potential charges and everything, is the motives of the person involved. And I write in, in the book that uh, <laughs> it's sort of fantasy where whoever it is gets convicted, gets sentenced, gets sent to prison, which they could well do since it's a breach of the Official Secrets Act. And I go and call on them and I'll sit down and say to them, so just tell me, why did you do it? And uh, part of this is, is the sort of, um, uh, the, the, the pretend author in me, because I think it would make a wonderful extra chapter to the paperback edition of the book. And part of me is just curiosity. Curiosity. Was it some kind of bigger conspiracy or was it just a guy who, um, I mean, I don't think I knew him, whoever it was, yeah. didn't, didn't like the kind of thing I wrote, thought I was too critical of Donald Trump or thought we need to make sure the next guy in Washington is someone who gets Trump and, and, that, that has to be a politician. We'll see, we'll see. There was a lot of reaction at the time, irrespective of what they thought about you personally or knew you personally, about the impact of, of this leak uh, and your resignation on, on the diplomatic service more broadly, especially the UK uh, diplomatic service in terms of the candor with which yeah. colleagues of yours with ambassadors around the world would be able to express themselves, knowing that there's a possibility of the, the confidential information being uh, you know, exposed to the public, uh, to the, to the outside world. So do you think, has that happened, do you think? Do you, are you aware in the Foreign Office that, uh, that people are more circumspect in terms of their reporting? When it happened, Paul, the Permanent Secretary in the Foreign Office, who's obviously a good friend of mine, 
held an all staff meeting and got the largest attendance of any meeting he'd ever held because this sent a huge shockwave around the system. And as long as there was no arrest, no apparent likelihood of anyone being, being, um, uh, being found out, uh, then I think it did affect how people did their jobs, not, not unnaturally. And you know, the risk of it all is that people will only report critical comments in future by telephone and will never put anything in writing. Mm. And I mean, you know, if you're reporting as I was for National Security Council, you can't ring up seven or eight ministers separately and then ring up all the officials around it. Unless you put it in writing, it's yeah. not going to work. So it would have been uh, really damaging for the Foreign Office and the D Diplomatic Service in particular, but the civil service in general, if, um, you know, if, uh, if whoever did this had managed to get away with it completely. That now looks much less likely, but there is no question in my mind, and I hear this still from friends inside the office, that it has a ch it's had a chilling effect on how people report. And just one more point, if I may, there's nothing unique about the way British diplomats report on the governments to which they are accredited. In some cases, the word regime is more appropriate than governments around the world. If you look at that huge dump of State Department cables on WikiLeaks yeah. about a decade ago, some of the reporting in that about some of the governments to their credit is pretty sharp edged. So it's what we diplomats do. Right. Uh, what comes out in the, in the book also is you have this great affection for the United States and, and pretty encyclopedic knowledge of American politics. So it goes back clearly many, many years. You're a big fan of the country and its politics. Um, so you must imagine pretty thrilled when you got the Washington ambassadorship post. And obviously it's the highlight of your career, but it wasn't just another diplomatic posting for you, was it? No, it wasn't. Um, I hadn't unusually for ambassadors in Washington, to Washington ever been posted there before, though there was a moment in my career when I was going to Harvard to do a year's sabbatical and then going on to Washington to be political counselor there. And then what happened? Um, someone, uh, a friend of ours called John Grant, uh, who was then a counselor in Accra, um, in Brussels, uh, was pulled back to be Robin Cook's chief of staff. Well, and they said to me, you got to Accra. Tony Blair, for our American friends. Robin Cook was foreign minister under Tony Blair. Right, that's right. Anyway, he was pulled back to be Robin Cook's chief of staff, foreign secretary's chief of staff. And they said to me, you've got lots of uh, Brussels experience. So you go to Brussels, not to Harvard. And my wife has never really forgiven the service for, for that. It was such a, such a blow. Um, but I've always, I've always loved America. I've been there many times, but like most Brits, I've been to the East and West coasts, even to Hawaii from my time in Japan, but never to, to middle, to real America, to the middle of the country. And I've always been fascinated by um, American politics. I'm showing my age now, but as a teenager and as a student, I read all of Theodore White's books. There's yeah. an expression of them about the making of the president, 1968, yeah. 1972. Yeah. And they are wonderful, wonderful pieces of reportage. And the, the glamour and the theater of uh, American politics and especially American election campaigns, but also, of course, Watergate, which happened while I was at university, has captivated me all my, all my life. And I remember when I first got to Washington, um, being driven past the Watergate Hotel, which is a very ordinary building. Yeah. But for me, this was, this was an extraordinary piece of history that we were just driving past. It was astonishing to me, but you know, it was just just this, this building you drove past when yeah, some kind of things that happened there. All right, okay, well, let's move on to the momentous events in American politics the last few days. Now that I see you've become a TV pundit, that's very American of you, Kim. Um, my first question is, were you predicting this particular outcome or like many pollsters, were you taken by surprise? Um, I predicted, and I even hint at it in the book, which I finished in, um, in July, 2019, uh, that um, I mean, July. Sorry, I mean July 2020. I even predicted in that that I saw Biden coming out ahead. Um, and there's a sentence in it which says, uh, "Have um, you know? Have the Americans tired of the great disruptor?" Um, and uh, 
Yes, so I always thought Biden would win. I said so several times in interviews before um, the election happened. But of course, we were all fooled, Paul, by the polls. Because as a friend of mine, who's a leading pollster, emailed me today, the polls were wronger in a way in 2020 than they were in 20, 2016. Uh, because they predicted this big, big margin for Joe Biden, and uh, it wasn't there. And, you know, if you were in the election, if you're watching it in Europe overnight through, um, through Tuesday and Wednesday last week, it felt for a while like a rerun of 2016 yeah, yeah. with Trump against all predictions actually yeah. coming, out, coming out ahead. So in that sense, um, I hadn't anticipated. I thought the polls... Had to hold was have to be better than 2016, but they were worse. Have you ever met uh, Vice uh, President elect uh, Joe Biden or Vice President? Yeah, I met him, I've, met him, I've met him twice, and um, first time was when, as Vice President, we invited him to attend the British National Security Council, and I had to go and brief him beforehand on how the thing would unfold and then take him in, introduce him to people and uh, you know, see him perform there. And then in early 20, 2019, before he had even declared, I um, went to call on him, basically to try and find out if he would declare or not. I was told I'd get 20 minutes in his Washington office um, and an hour and a half after I entered the room, he was still talking. And his aide only dragged him away because he had a plane to catch. And that is Joe Biden, everyone will tell you. He is, he radiates decency. He is as nice a man uh, as you will come across in politics. And he is wise and funny and, um, and sharp. But he also, you know, he's a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> he, he, can, he, could, he could have talked for another, another hour and a half. When he did the National Security Council, he did... Um, we gave him 15 minutes at the end of the meeting. The meetings were always exactly an hour, two o'clock to three o'clock. And at 3.30, Joe was still talking. So it was all very good stuff, but um, this is a man who, uh, once you've, you've pressed the button and turned him on, um, you know, the reels keep running. Well, the one reason I was asking the question wasn't just to find out what your social diary and stuff, but also, you know, there's a lot of comment, in, especially in the British media at the moment, about the now pressing and urgent need for Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, and his and his team to to get to know uh, uh, Biden and, and his own team. Um, how difficult, in your view, or, or easy, will it be for Boris Johnson and his team to to establish a constructive relationship, working relationship with the, the new Biden team? Yeah. Um, it's a good question, Paul, and you know, this is all, this is all get to it, there are, there are straws in the wind, but I've always thought that we, we are starting from a suboptimum position for a few reasons. Reason one, Biden and the Democrats in general don't much like Brexit, and uh, they therefore they have their, their doubts about those who advocated leave. Second, um, uh, they don't like, they don't like what, what my Prime Minister said when he was Foreign Secretary, when Obama came over to uh, London in, um, in 2016, May 2016, a few weeks before the Brexit vote, and did a press conference with David Cameron and when asked, would we get a free trade deal with the US if we left the EU? And he said, uh, American interests would dictate that the priorities would be trade deals with Asia Pacific and with, with the EU, so you'd be at the back of the queue. And Boris Johnson, Foreign Secretary, um, accused Obama, this part Kenyan president, of having an ancestral dislike of the British Empire. And that's still remembered in Democrat circles um, and still deeply resented. They were incensed at the time. And Obama actually responded. He almost never responded to criticism, but he responded to this. Uh, so um, that went down extraordinarily badly. And Ben Rhodes, who was Obama's chief um, speechwriter, tweeted about it, saying, I remember this only a few weeks ago. So it's still, it's still fresh. Also, also, I think that there is a penalty if you are seen as having been a little too friendly with Donald Trump. Uh, 
Yeah. And I fear that the Prime Minister may fall into that category, though he did so for perfectly understandable national interest reasons. So add all that together, and I think there, there may be a penalty for us. There may be um, a little coolness at the beginning of the relationship. It may be translated in us being rather slow to get our slot for the Prime Minister to phone in his congratulations to President Biden. It may be manifested in some off the record briefing to the media. There's already potentially an example of it in the Sunday Times today, which I think comes from someone in the Biden camp, a story about um, some very critical stuff about Boris Johnson there. So we're not in a great place to start with. However, I think Joe Biden, sorry to go on about this, but, but it's, it's interesting because Joe Biden is an arch pragmatist who over his 40 year odd career in the Senate worked with many people we must have profoundly disagreed with on, on, on issues um, and depends what we bring to the table. What we don't bring, Paul, as you know, is we don't bring any more a voice around the EU table. We can't claim that we can influence where the EU comes out on issues, whether legislation or whether positioning, whether sanctions on Russia, whatever. And that weakens us a bit, but we are hosting the COP26 climate change, UN climate change conference next year, 2021. And Biden will take the US back into the Paris climate change deal. And I think if we say to him, come and work with us to shape the outcome of this big international conference on climate change, that will interest them. Biden has talked about ending the forever wars. And there is an American presence still alongside British presence in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I think Syria, and we can work with them on working out the right sort of exit strategy if that's what we want, or if we're going to leave some people there, how we do that. And just more broadly, the defense, intelligence, and security relationship, can we contribute a lot to that? And as if that counts to the Americans. But I would just, as I say, expect some coolness initially, and I would expect a real problem if we go for no deal Brexit and we decide to, I find myself struggling even to say this, but if we decide as, as the government has threatened to break international law by unilaterally rewriting our EU withdrawal agreement, that will really put us in, in terrible trouble with the Americans because the Irish will be furious. And Joe Biden is half Irish and very proud of his Irish roots. And, uh, you know, we will just get really stuck if we do that. But I hope we won't. We're, we're moving to questions quite soon. There are quite a few coming through. So uh, you and I have to maybe uh, stop talking in a second, certainly give maybe shorter answers. But before I pass on to the, the questions from the audience, um, I know you're not very keen on the phrase special relationship. And you say in the book, you kind of informally banned its use to your colleagues. But how would you characterize the state and the status of the so-called special, or at least the US-UK relations in 2020, irrespective of who's in power on either side of the pond? I think there are different levels to it, Paul. And um, as I've said, uh, security, intelligence, um, defense, that goes on whatever. And there is an awful lot of military talking to military and you know, intelligence agencies talking to intelligence agencies. Whoever is sitting in the White House or in Number 10 Downing Street. So I'm very confident that that will continue to flourish and to serve the security uh, interests of, of people in both countries and actually more widely uh, in the international community. Economic relationship, US is our biggest source of, biggest recipient of British exports. 20% of our exports go to the US biggest single country, I and mean, obviously the EU takes 40%, but that's 28 countries. So that's still hugely important, and it's important to the US as well. They send a lot of stuff to us. Cultural, um, there is still a huge amount of interchange um, in the arts and culture world. And I'm always fascinated and pleased by just how many British actors and actresses get leading parts playing Americans. Yeah, I don't know if, whether you saw the film of Selma, but there's a British actor playing Martin Luther King. Can you yeah. imagine that? How can that be the case? We used to play the villains, didn't we, the Brits, but now we're playing the heroes as well, which is good. Well, so there's all that. And then you've got the government to government relationship and that has its ups and downs. And I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, if, if we go through a cooler period, that's not the first time. And I remember, for example, 
a period when John Major wouldn't take a phone call from Bill Clinton because the American administration had given a visa to allow Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness to visit the US yeah, back right. in the early 90s. Um, uh, and I also remember when LBJ got furious with the UK because we refused to back what he was doing in Vietnam. So it happens, it happens. Um, but you know, the bedrock is still, is still pretty solid. So we'll have a cooler period maybe, maybe, and then we'll have to work our way back. And that may mean the Johnson government eating a certain amount of humble pie, but, but you know, um, uh, the fundamentals of the friendship, special or not, will remain. All right, okay. We're gonna to move to some questions from the audience, Kim. Um, lady called Wendy, I don't know her last name, asks, Ambassador, do you see the international reputation of America as reparable? Presumably, when do you voted for Joe Biden? Is the reputation of America reparable? I completely do. And um, I think two things on this. I think Joe Biden, I think, will do a quick reset. And I expect him to come over to Europe early and reaffirm US support for NATO and repair relations with the EU and go and see Angela Merkel in Berlin and maybe see Macron. I don't think London necessarily will be on the top of his list, but let's hope that it is. Maybe he'll go to Ireland. And it will feel very quickly, especially as people's memories nowadays are so sort of short on things, it can feel very quickly like back to normal. Um, and, uh, you know, People still respect American values. They still love um, American culture. Um, so I'd be comforted by that. The one thing I'd say though, Paul, is, you know, I could talk for 10 minutes on this, but I'll do it very quickly. I don't think Donald Trump is going to go away. Uh, he got more votes losing this time than he got winning in 2016. Um, he is building a narrative that the whole election was stolen from him. Um, if he were to run in 2024, which is already being floated already, um, he would only be about the same age as Joe Biden is now. Um, he will have a powerful voice on Twitter. Um, who knows, maybe Fox News will still be keen to hear his thoughts on things. So um, I think that that'll make it very difficult for the Republican Party to move on. Yeah. Um, and I think that he's going to still be a, you know, a very visible voice on the scene. Um, and that, of course, may affect people's perceptions of where America is. But I think if you're looking for a healing president, um, Joe Biden, with his likability, with his history of personal tragedy and his qualities of empathy, is the best person you could have chosen. Okay. That well-known person, Anonymous, asks, how will a Biden-Harris presidency influence the future relationship of Ireland with the UK and with the rest of Europe? Well, this is partly up to us. It's how we handle things. And as I said, uh, Paul, if we can get a, a deal with the EU, a post-Brexit you know, trade deal, not just trade, but the rest of the relationship as well. And if it all you know, ends, negotiations end amicably uh, and productively and positively, and we are seen to be continuing to contribute in future, even from outside the EU, in terms of what we're doing, in terms of what we do on climate change or international you know, conflicts or um, uh, whatever, then uh, it can all be good. We all are between us and the rest of the EU, uh, provided we do nothing to threaten specifically the Good Friday Agreement, it can be good with Ireland in the future. It's important to both sides that they have a good and productive relationship. And Boris, Boris Johnson doesn't want to be, I mean, Boris likes to be popular. He doesn't yeah. want to be on bad terms with anyone. Yeah. So, you know, he's much, he's going to be much happier if, if relations look good. But an awful lot rests on how we um, on how we how we end Brexit. The other thing I'd say is that I think Joe Biden or his administration can and will play a constructive brokering role if it looks to be going very badly. But, you know, let's see how, how things unfold. But on that brokering role, which is uh, maybe, maybe welcome in some quarters, and obviously it will be instantly uh, criticised by others as interference by the US in domestic British politics, no? Yeah, I mean, there will be people, um, there already are people who, um, who aren't thrilled about Joe Biden's election in the UK. You know, it's not kind of a 100% monolithic country supporting, supporting Biden. There are plenty of Trump supporters over here. Um, and there are those 
who have been very critical already of what Joe Biden has said about the consequences for Britain if we appear to be threatening the Good Friday Agreement, doing the wrong thing on, on, on the withdrawal agreement, and so on. And they already said that's interference unacceptable. As they said back in 2016, when, when Obama said we're at the back of the queue for a free trade deal. So there's going to be some backlash, but that doesn't stop. I mean, you, that will be background noise if there is any US attempt to try and bring us together. But if it's done subtly and cleverly, then, um, then uh, I think it's, it can still help. I just mem remember um, uh, the American contribution to getting the Good Friday Agreement and what George Mitchell in particular, who's a wonderful statesman, contributed then. And that kind of, uh, kind of role and that kind of personality, that can work. Okay, a question from Viv. I'm not sure whether you're a woman or a man, Viv, but your question is as follows. You mentioned the real America, Kim. Do you think it will move on from the cult of Trump? Is your experience that there are enough Republicans out there to help bring the divisions a little less frightful, she's, he or she says? Well, as I've said, Paul, I think that, um, that Donald Trump did well enough in this election, expanded his vote, mm. um, did well in particular amongst Latinos in some parts of the country, notably in Florida. Um, uh, that, that, and, and as I say, has been building this narrative that the election has been, has been stolen. But a lot of his supporters will stick with him. Um, and if he chooses to try to remain active politically, to keep tweeting, to keep being out there on the media, and to floating the idea that he might run again in 2024, I think it's quite tough for the Republicans to move on from him. And I think that becomes then a, quite a divided a divided party. Um, if Trump plays even more golf than he has done in the last <laughs> 24 hours and, uh, and says he's not interested in running again, uh, then, um, then it's different and they can move on to a new generation. That said, you will see, I think, in the Republican Party, the same sort of split, except in their image, as you've seen between the progressives and the moderates in the uh, Democrat Party. If you look at potential candidates for 2024 on the Republican ticket, there are people out there like uh, Tom Cotton from Arkansas. I think Ted Cruz might run again. People like that on that wing of the Republican Party who won't be like Trump in style, but in some of the policies, they would be quite like him. And then you assume there'd be some figures on the more moderate wing um, who would be somewhere else. So, uh, so you know, it can be quite tricky for the Democrats to handle, for the Republicans to handle all this. Going back briefly to your answer to my question about the special relationship, you mentioned culture. Dinah Reich, who's the, as you know, the organizer, inspiration behind the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, uh, asked me to point out that in many ways, this festival is a symbol of the unique Anglo-American cultural relationship. Well, wow. so now we've heard it from, from the boss. He's, from he's dead right. And um, yeah. it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Right. You've touched on this already, Kim, but let me, let's me let go a bit further into, into the weeds, as it were. Uh, there's much talk, of course, of Joe Biden immediately on entering office, uh, re-engaging with the world community, rejoining the Paris Climate Accord you mentioned, rejoining the Iran nuclear deal, rejoining the World Health Organization, and so on. These are all obviously tremendously significant steps, but at the same time, it simply returned the US to the status quo ante. Apart from this sort of symbolism, very important symbolism of these actions about rejoining, do you see this not just as a sign of new engagement or, you know, coming back to re-engaging with the outside world, uh, the United States, but also showing uh, the desire for more to give leadership? I think so. I think so, Paul. I mean, one I would add to your list is the American, the minister, this administration, the current administration has been blocking, this sounds very techy, they're blocking the appointment of judges to the appellate, appellate court of the World Trade Organization uh, and also showing not much interest in who gets appointed as the next president of the World Trade Organization. And that's all part of an America first agenda on trade, which is not so much America first as America alone. They are taking on, I mean, they don't like the idea of an international body which could overrule the US on trade issues, an international court that would overrule the US, and they want to pursue their trade disputes, principally with China, but there is also a looming trade dispute with the EU, alone. 
I think Biden will reverse all of that, but he won't give up on trying to get China to change its trade practices, to stop all this theft of intellectual property, to stop the compulsory transfer of technology, to remove all the hidden barriers in the Chinese trade system. But I think what Biden will do is use World Trade Organization um, mechanisms uh, and multilateralize the whole thing. So if you revive the WTO, suddenly you have that option. Um, and so you can both return, as it were, to the status quo ante on, on American participation in the multilateral community, but also energize that community by uh, actually using it to do things. Use the Security Council to embarrass Russia on the sort of things it's getting up to. Um, rejoin the Iran nuclear deal, but then rally your allies to press Iran to do more on reducing its development of ballistic missiles and to stop doing the things that it is doing in Yemen and in Iraq and in Lebanon and in Syria. So it can be both, it can be both. It doesn't just have to be just to return to the status quo. Yeah, you talked about this already a bit, but we have a question again from the audience. Uh, so let's get, again go a bit more depth. Will the future of populism in American politics uh, for the Republican Party mean that they'll be looking to elect more, or trying to elect more entertaining candidates like, like Trump in the future, or will they return to traditional Republican candidates like McCain, Romney, and those kind of personalities? You know, I mean, I thought, I thought about this a bit, and of course, this is all guesswork, um, Paul, but I'm not sure that it's going to be easy to find a new Trump, if that's your objective. Um, People who don't like Trump will, will gasp at this, a bit of this, but there is a genius. I think it's an instinctive, not a sort of calculated genius about the way Trump communicates with his base, energizes his base and uses them, energizes them, make sure they all get out to vote um, and, and whatever. And those skills, that sort of talent, that, that way he communicates with them, which is like no other politician I've come across ever, anywhere. Um, I'm just not sure there's going to be anyone else who, um, who can replicate all of that. So my feeling, uh, and I kind of hope I'm right on this, is that this guy is genuinely a one-off. That there was a perfect storm in 2016 with this non-politician, with no no history to defend. I mean, he had lots of history there, but he didn't have a sort of legislative or political history to defend against a deeply unpopular candidate for reasons I never understood. Why was Hillary so unpopular with Americans? Because she was an extraordinarily effective uh, person, uh, politician. And I met her a few times and I thought she was likable. So I never got that. But that perfect storm in 2016, um, I'm just not sure you're ever going to replicate that, but um, you know, we'll see. <laughs> A question from, from Robert. What do you expect to be the China policy of the Biden administration? Will he be more open to Chinese competition? I think that he will. I think he might. I mean, this is tricky for him because there is now a consensus, I believe, in the American national community establishment, both sides of the aisle, about the strategic challenge, arguably the strategic threat from China. Um, so I think it's, it's easy for Joe, Joe Biden to kind of back off on all of it. And you've got all these tariffs in place, which actually I think harm um, uh, American consumers more than they harm China. And you have piles of unsold soya and whatever sitting around the Midwest. So Joe Biden, I guess, would want to reverse a lot of that, but he can't afford to be seen to be going soft on China. So that's why I think that he will look to multilateralize it to get allies to agree on a policy of putting pressure on China. If you're going to go down the tariff route, try and get allies to do it, try and get the EU to do it as well, or whatever. But also a dialogue with China, and going off to see President Xi, meeting him at some neutral place, and trying to talk through with him the way forward. Trying to work with China on climate change, get a good outcome from the uh, international conference that we are hosting in at the end of 2021. It'd be a different approach, but he can't afford to go soft. And, and he has to keep the pressure on what China is doing militarily in the South China Sea, 
with all of these islands that it is literally building um, with all the water that it isn't justified in claiming, but is nevertheless claiming, um, and with its pressure on bullying of its smaller neighbors. It to be tough on that too, tough on Chinese behavior in Hong Kong. So I think China is one of the big, big challenges for Joe Biden to find a different approach that gets more results without appearing to go soft. I don't want to sort of dampen the mood or the atmosphere, but is there a danger, at least on the European side, the EU and the UK include, included for the purposes of the question, uh, that uh, the EU and the UK will be a bit disappointed by, by Biden? I asked the question because um, even when Obama became president, there was a famous pivot to Asia that got the Europeans very nervous. And, and, and to be fair, to point to President Trump, he, when it comes to things like burden sharing in NATO, he was yeah. saying, obviously, in rather less elegant language, what President Obama has been saying about the need for some, most European countries who belong to NATO to pay more contributions to NATO, for example. And, and again, on, the, on, on issues like trade and globalization, uh, is there a danger, at least on our European side, that we start making assumptions, premature assumptions, about what a Biden presidency would be about? I think there really is. I think that's a very good point. You and I have both tracked you know, American, sorry, European politics for 30, 40 odd years, maybe longer, and um, we have an endless capacity to disappoint over here. <laughs> and uh, will too many Europeans continue to fail to do what they promised on NATO and spend 2% of GDP on it? Especially in the wake of coronavirus, when everyone is going to be trying to repay the costs of that. I just don't see many more getting to the 2% quickly. So that will be disappointing. And on trade, I mean, we Brits were never fans of EU policy on blocking out all American agriculture behind, I mean, okay, you can argue about chlorinated chicken, but all this stuff about, um, uh, about uh, I mean, hormone-treated beef, I must have eaten a lot of that over my four, three and a half years in Washington. I think it's all right. And, um, and these crops, which have been genetically modified, they're okay, they're okay. And I think when the Americans say you're just inventing spurious scientific stuff to keep our produce out because it's cheaper, they have a point. So I can easily see, even if we launch as, I mean, there was an attempt to reach an EU-US free trade deal under Obama in his second term, and it stalled on issues like this, access from American agriculture, amongst other things. And it would be a great shame if it stalled again for exactly the same reasons. So right. um, the world needs some big free trade deals. It's one of the ways you revive the economy after the virus, after the pandemic. And we may just get stuck on, um, uh, on the same old, not very convincing reasons for not doing it. We're running out of time, so this is going to be my, my last question to you, Kim. Um, and it's about you. You're clearly, it seems to me anyway, enjoying your, your new life outside the diplomatic service. Uh, you're now a, a successful author, it has to be said. It sticks in my throat a bit, but clearly you are very successful <laughs> with this book. Um, and you've become a TV pundit. Um, so what are the next steps? Are you going to write a, a sequel to Collateral Damage, uh, part two? Uh, we'll find out what happens. It's funny you should, you should ask that, Paul, because I had a meeting with my agent um, a couple of weeks ago, and she is encouraging me to write a sequel. But hey, it wouldn't be a sequel. It would be, it would be a prequel, because I've done the last four years of my career, my time in Washington. Before that, I was a national security advisor. Before that, I was ambassador to the European Union, when you and I would see each other <laughs> almost every day. And before that, I was Tony Blair's EU advisor. And before that, I had a fascinating period doing Bosnia and then Kosovo um, in the 90s. And there are lots of stories to be told from those times and lots of lessons, I think, to be drawn from that period. I mean, just in a sentence. We used to do successful interventions. Sierra Leone, the Bush uh, major... Uh, you know, then kicking Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And the whole history of international humanitarian interventions has gone wrong with Afghanistan and uh, Iraq in you know, 2000. And now we, you know, it's almost impossible to make the case for that kind of thing. How we got from where we were to there, that is itself a really important story. And I believe in the future, to make the world a better place, we need to go back to the kind of confidence that we had 
in the 1990s when we did these things successfully. So maybe that's the theme of the next book. But yes, I do. I think I do think uh, you know unless someone wants to come along and offer me you know a lot more money to go into uh, be a consultant business or whatever, I think uh, it will be another book and and it will be the earlier that earlier period. It's a prequel, not a sequel. Then. A prequel. A prequel. Right. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Kim. Thank you for your time. And before you go, I'd like to also thank Dana Reich and, and Leah Ryan, the organizers of this event. They, without them, we couldn't be able to make this event uh, happen. Uh, we also, both of us have to thank our dear friend, Bill Kanaf, for what, what, whatever he said about us at the beginning. We had no idea. If it wasn't very nice, our thanks are slightly redundant. Uh, but that's all from here. Thank you all in the audience for, for watching and uh, listening to us. And, uh, ask, and thank you for your questions as well. Uh, see you next time, whenever that is. Thank you very much. Thank you.